So can I ask uh, Rifat and Irene to come up? Uh, Rifat is a professor of international health management at Imperial College, and many of you will know him very well from his work uh, in and with the Global Fund. And Irene is a long-standing public health uh, guru in Ghana, both for Ghanian, uh, Ghanians and well as internationally, and now professor of public health at the Ghana School of uh, Public Health. So. <coughs> First, may I then give the floor to Rifat. Uh, thank you, Tore. Um, good afternoon. Uh, and Your Excellency, it's a, it's a real privilege to be here. It's not often one gets an opportunity to, to comment on a 26-page Lancet document with uh, 486 authors from 310 institutions with 11 figures and three or four tables. So it was, a, it was a most interesting read. But it's a very, very important um, study, because this the study marks the first systematic reassessment of disease and injury-specific epidemiology since the 1990s study. It's very comprehensive, as you heard. In all dimensions, it has expanded. And it has expanded not just in terms of the, the disease conditions looked at and disabilities, but also we've gone to 21 now called Global Burden of Disease Regions, a new classification for the 1990, 2005, and 2010. So I'd like to congratulate Chris and Alan for their incredible leadership um, of leading group of scholars um, that include Rafael Lozano, Majid Ezzati, Josh Solomon, Kenji Shibuya, Steve Lim, but to name a few. So what's new? Um, I, from this rich information, um, I glean two major shifts. The first is a continued and rapid shift from communicable to non-communicable diseases, though we heard today that these terms no longer make sense. So I strongly agree. I think it was Richard who suggested that we should get rid of these terms. Um, uh, the second shift is um, away from premature death to years live with disability. We're living longer, but we're accumulating disability along the way. In this, the epidemiologic polarization does persist. So for example, in, in Africa, much of the burden is still due to um, infectious, maternal, neonatal, and nutritional conditions, although NCDs are rising rapidly. But more specifically, as uh, Chris identified, there's a big decline in DALIs in under five, uh, children under five, um, whereas in 1990, 41% of the total uh, DALIs globally were accounted for under five. Um, uh, burden in 2010, that was 25%, largely due to reductions in acute respiratory illness, acute diarrheal illness, and malaria. HIV AIDS, not gone away, continues to cause huge death and disability, a massive rise from 33rd position in 1990 uh, to fifth position in 2010 in terms of death and disability. Chris talked about death alone. So 351% increase. And malaria burden remains high. I was surprised that malaria burden remained at the seventh level, um, given the earlier paper you published, um, Chris, with colleagues in The Lancet. Uh, but I was also surprised to large increases in musculoskeletal conditions, back pain, neck pain, but also items such as migraine um, that appear uh, quite high. So what are the implications for policymakers? I mean, this is all very interesting, but what are we going to do about it? Well, I think there are two major implications. The first is that the future demand or the burden will be shaped by chronicity and disability. And we didn't talk about multimorbidity that individuals will have. Most individuals, certainly in developed countries, will have a number of these conditions together. But the health systems are not prepared for this at all, certainly in the countries where, where the um, chronicity is increasing most rapidly. So there's a huge transformation agenda in re redesigning health systems, delivery models, but also reward systems, which currently reward acute episodes of man managing acute episodes of illness rather than prevention and maintenance of good health. The second implication is a major opportunity. Because I think what Chris uh, Allen and the colleagues have managed to produce is a global public good. They can be used not just at the global level, but at country level, by global policymakers as well as country level uh, policymakers. 
It makes uh, possible the transformation um, in use of this information to set priorities, but also monitor on an ongoing basis the impact of investments in health. And I was very encouraged to hear that there will be annual updates of the study. This transparency will be great because at country level one can work with policymakers. First, first to validate the data, make the results more reliable and reduce uncertainty, but also increase transparency and accountability to the taxpayers and the public who work very hard to finance health systems. And finally, I'd like to once again um, congratulate uh, the authors because the global burden of disease collaboration has established a very successful model on par with the Cochrane collaboration and has really set a new benchmark in global health. And I would say this is global health at its best. So congratulations, Chris. And now to you, Irene. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I echo Rifat's congratulations to the, all those who worked on this. I'm going to comment from an implementation, decision-making, and policy perspective. And I will have a low middle-income bias, and I think that is OK. Um, <laughs> okay. And um, basically, uh, to me, the key things are the fact that there's a double burden of disease globally. The MDG problems remain, but then you also have these other problems which we don't know what to call anymore, you know. <laughs> and then there are areas of relatively less attention in the past that may not have increased, but are clearly a problem and need some attention, like the injuries and the mental health. And my other comment is that in sub-Saharan Africa, where I come from, the burden, yes, is still predominantly MDG 4, 5, 6. But I think it's only a matter of time before we also have a lot of the cardiovascular burdens. And in fact, in the greater Accra region where I work, which is 90% urban, our second most frequent problems at OPD are cardiovascular, and it's the lead cause of death. Now, that is a small part of Ghana, if you like, 15% of the population. But if you look at the fact that it has risen from, a, the country has risen from 20% urban in the 70s to almost 50% urban today. And the same thing is happening across low and middle income countries all over the world. It's only a matter of time. And if we are talking about projecting into the future, we need to start thinking about this, even as we focus on the today problems. So those are some of my comments on looking into the future. In dealing with the noun, I think the sub-regional variation means that there are limits to which all priorities can be set globally. It's still important to try and set global priorities, but we do need to recognize the limits. I mean, clearly there are some priorities which are global across. I mean, road injuries showed relative stability across the regions, whereas the MDG 4-5 issues are more a problem in my part of the world and you know, almost no problem in this part of the world. Okay. That, so that also raises the importance of the national uh, data sets, and I, I really look forward to seeing them. Because even within one region, if you take sub-Saharan Africa, if, even if you take the HIV AIDS problem or the malaria problem, as the excellent diagram Chris showed, the, 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 the priorities move in bands. It's not a uniform aggregation. Now, my thoughts about issues to think about moving forward. This is an excellent report. I'm sure it's going to be converted into advocacy and action. And I want to, I think that is excellent, it should. But I want to raise a caution. I'll raise my global level cautions and then my country level cautions. At the global level, my caution is not to allow this report to provide further fuel to the Cadillacs for a few and nothing for everybody else approach to international development. Or as another writer has aptly called it islands of happiness in oceans of misery. Um, describing the process where a lot of money is allocated to a global priority disease and nothing is given to everybody else, but the problems affect the same people living in the same communities in the same countries and they are complexly interrelated. So you are getting antiretroviral therapy free and you die a maternal death because there's no theater. Now, who have we helped? So I really want to flag that, take this opportunity to flag that caution and say, let's work on this, but can we please avoid this problem? 
And related to that, some focus in global support must go on strengthening countries and systems to actually effectively take charge of the micro planning, the monitoring, and the evaluation. Because as you have seen, despite the global priorities, there's a lot of variations. And when you try to micromanage change, at these country levels from a global perspective, it really does not work because you have a one size fits all and unfortunately everybody is not one size. Okay, so the report is good, it's drawing our attention, we know where to focus now, but can we realize that it's a very complex report and in trying to focus, we need to draw this balance between strengthening the system on which everything rests, priority or non-priority, and also moving the priorities forward. This is a harder approach, and you will not get short-term dramatic gains, um, which can be presented in glossy booklets and materials and videos, which is the downside. But I think in the long run, if we want to help the world, maybe we should all rethink what we reward, whether we reward exciting short-term glossy brochures, or whether we reward long-term building of systems that makes change that is sustained. Okay, and related to that, I think we need to strengthen the routine health management information system. I was particularly struck by the fact that, you know, vital registration systems, I think one presenter said, in about half the countries we had problems. Yet this kind of work is so hugely important, I think we should invest a bit in strengthening those systems so that the next generation of report has far more data. Data matters and we should invest in data quality, building and maintaining systems and building and maintaining capacity. My last point, Sub-Saharan Africa. Clearly we have problems and I think we need to have clear country and sub-regional agendas within Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm sorry, I'm speaking to an audience which has very few people from Sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm sure you still talk to colleagues and friends in Sub-Saharan Africa. Basically, if you don't have an agenda, somebody else will set your agenda for you and you can't complain if the agenda takes you where you do not want to be. And I think that is part of our problem in Sub-Saharan Africa. We need to set our own agenda agenda, insist on the agenda, and get somewhere. Thank you very much. So thank you very much uh, um, for these uh, points. Uh, I would like uh, to add some uh, specific uh, uh, questions for um, <clears throat> Chris before we open the floor. Uh, it would be very interesting to hear, if possible, in the discussion yesterday with the UK, where was the biggest discrepancies between what uh, they knew and what you presented? Uh, <coughs> it would be very interesting to hear in relation to your forthcoming visit to Norway. <coughs> the second is that uh, as you see the great uh, individuality in relation to countries, we have always talked about cross-country comparisons in terms of you know, what is one country doing well and uh, which another country should learn from. And I think I must say that that discussion has been disappointing in terms of actually leading to some action. And so I would like you to with this uh, now very rich amount of data, and can you tell you know, other countries if you took the 1990 and the expectation for 2010, for example, then in the area NCDs have done particularly well compared to other countries, or other countries that have done particularly bad. <clears throat> so I think that is uh, <coughs> one thing. And the third thing is a comment to Irene I think now, because of the word transition, the fact that Ethiopia this year has an increased health budget of their own resources of $180 million, clearly the national responsibility will become much more apparent uh, and much more real than what we have uh, said before but not uh, lived up to. And I think we see the increased value of actually national initiatives 
politically strongly backed, like the National Rural Health Mission, like saving a million lives in Nigeria, and uh, uh, then also the Save Motherhood by Joyce Banda in Malawi. And I think, Irene, this is your opportunity to actually to launch your initiative, and then it's much easier for us to fit in, in terms of, I talk now as a donor, in terms of how we can contribute to that kind of initiative and before kind of planning and so on has taken place. So, so I think that uh, 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 there is a great opportunity now for the low income and low, low, middle income countries to grasp the agenda. You have a lot of resources yourself and to really to set the agenda in the way that you are asking for. Thank you. So over to you, Chris, and then we open the floor. And uh, let me answer, Tori, and Alan's also here to answer uh, if, uh, for some of the parts that I may, may miss. Uh, you asked about the UK. Uh, so what we showed yesterday in the policy discussion uh, around the UK was country-specific results for the UK in compared to other EU countries as well as the US, Japan, and Australia. And I think what, was, what triggered the most interest in discussion, I believe, was the ability to look at both change in the UK over time and then compare that change to what other countries had achieved. So it was sort of the relative performance benchmarking. And there were lots of surprises. Uh, you know, the one area where the UK had done really well was uh, improving its relative performance on ischemic heart disease. So they had been 140th, and now they're about 65th across nations in terms of age standardized death rates. Uh, places where the UK was doing really well, which was surprising to them, uh, was the diabetes. So the UK has one of the lowest age standardized diabetes death rates in the world. Despite the fact that it's an important clinical issue here, the fact that it's doing so well compared to the rest of Europe and, and particularly the US, uh, I think was notable. Uh, places where it stood out as very unusual falls. Big volume of services here, uh, things getting slightly worse over time, and not something that had come up uh, high on, on the agenda without that capacity to benchmark. So I think in, in uh, to segue into your second question, which is, you know, what can you learn from other countries, uh, and why hasn't there been more learning over time? Uh, at least in terms of the burden of disease, we haven't really had numbers built up country by country before. We did regional estimation and projected down sometimes in a very simplistic way to some countries. Now, for the burden of disease, all the analysis is built country by country. Uh, and that, it's also the dimension of time opens up this incredible potential for benchmarking. So you can look at change. And so you can also pick out comparator countries. Because I think if you just say, well, you know, the US is doing worse than Australia, people say, oh, that's Jane Holton. She's fixed to Australia. Uh, and you know, the, the US decision makers tune out. But if you can pick a country that they're you know, more want to compare themselves, let's say Cuba, uh, humor, humor. So, but more, on, a, on a more serious note, if you pick the countries that they do want to benchmark against, you now have the capacity to do that in a meaningful way, in a way that doesn't take uh, an army of research that in, in, in essentially a few clicks on a mouse, you can actually in explore uh, those sort of comparisons. And I think the other part that's new here that makes, I think, the potential for policy use of the database that's been created is, may seem trivial, but is real, which is the power of visualization. The, the accessibility of information to the public, to decision makers in tools that are intuitive and, and easy to navigate is transformational, at least in, in, in what I've been seeing and talking to various people. Uh, and I, I believe that's a, a very important thing for the future. I don't know, Alan, if you wanted to add to that. Uh, just very quickly, if I could, on, on the first point of Tories, uh, ad adding to what Chris mentioned, uh, a couple of other observations. One uh, with Richard Pito in the audience. Uh, breast cancer 
um, in the UK when it was benchmarked, benchmarked against these other countries was actually uh, a bigger problem than I think the UK uh, public policy people thought it might have been. So while there have been significant declines in the UK and indeed other countries in breast cancer mortality, breast cancer was still uh, ranked relatively highly as a, as a cause uh, when you compared with other countries here. The other one was alcohol, and it, it, it comes back to the the power of the comparative analyses of what, what, what I think this, this study can bring. The UK, like elsewhere, is aware that alcohol is a major issue. I'm not sure they advocated prohibition, but they certainly felt that um, they had a, a public health problem. They didn't realize just how big a public health problem they had when it was compared to um, the situation in other countries and indeed other conditions and risk factors in the UK alone. So there were a couple, I thought, of, of additional lessons that came out of there. Uh, and, I, and I think that the reaction from the UK public policy people was that this sort of evidence uh, is difficult to ignore. It may not be 100% right, it can never be right because we'll always lack data, but it was sufficiently convincing and compelling that they immediately wanted to do something about it. And, and I thought that was a, a very positive reaction. I have two other points, Chair, if I might. Um, coming back to what Irene had mentioned, and, and these are, uh, are introductions into some of the intriguing higher order public policy research issues which are not resolved, but which I believe the burden of disease is now laying out there. Not many of you seem to react when Chris showed a graph uh, in his presentation showing as a block globally, the rates of mortality from, sorry, the rates of DALIs and indeed mortality from NCDs are coming down. Now, I'm not sure that's widely appreciated. Uh, Irene made the point about urbanisation. There's been rapid urbanisation globally over the last two, two decades, but globally, uh, non-communicable disease as a public health problem in terms of rates is going down. What is going on here? What are we missing that we don't understand about that transition? So uh, I thought there were some important uh, research issues that are coming out of this finding, but also reinforcing the point that this is complex that it is not unidirectional. It's not communicable diseases going away, apart from HIV perhaps, and NCDs taking over. It, the, the situation, the story, is more complex, and hopefully the sorts of metrics that the burden of disease provide will allow us to try to untangle those causes uh, more precisely. The other point I want to do is to slightly abuse uh, the point that, um, that Irene raised, a very nice analogy of islands of joy and sea of misery, and take that a little bit further and propose to you on the basis of what we showed from the GBD this morning, that this concept of uh, avoidability, of avoidable death, of premature death, of, of premature illness and loss of health, really needs to be expanded beyond children. There is a vast agenda remaining. We do not deny that. But there is an equally vast agenda around um, preventing causes of, of, of ill health and health loss in young adults. And I think uh, Irene hinted at that, that we, we, it's not just sufficient that health systems are keeping children alive to adulthood, but we ought to be keeping adults alive into old age. And I think we, we need in the global public community to start thinking more about this holistic approach. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just uh, <coughs> two points uh, to make as comments. Uh, we, we see the complexity, and at the same time, uh, you know, I was in a meeting in Geneva, and uh, the representative for Britain said that, you know, the politicians in my country cannot hold more than three things in their mind at any point in time, to which I responded, that's not the problem in Norway, but they cannot communicate more than three things to the public at any one time. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I think there is really a challenge here in relation to how to simplify the message here and not simplify it in a way that has been done with the NCDs where one had just taken, you know, lifestyle diseases and thrown everything else away. And then what I, when I come to poor countries like Malawi, then representatives from WHO and so on uh, are saying, you know, you have, the health services have to start to... Uh, do, uh, invest in uh, treatment of NCDs and so on. And I get rather upset, you know, when the, the disease burden is so different. And clearly, what one should do in relation to NCDs is to, first of all, introduce tobacco taxes uh, and uh, 
uh, uh, taxes on uh, on bad foods uh, and uh, prevent uh, you know prohibit uh, advertisements. I think that's where you start when you think about uh, you know something coming in the future. Uh, so I think that is really a very uh, uh, important uh, to uh, uh, bear in mind. And in that regard also, from a practical point of view, it's very important to take the examples from countries which are big producers and at the same time have very good policies, so that you try to put a wedge between production, which is a much harder battle to fight, as compared to policy of uh, control. Thank you. And now the floor is open for discussion, and we have 35 minutes for discussion. So please, over to you. This uh, hand down there, and further down there. And again, we may take four at a time, and then we will take the next session. And please introduce yourself again. Uh, so we have at least uh, three. Uh, so uh, please, no? Yeah, uh, this is Leonor yeah. Guariguata from the International Diabetes Federation. And I'm just wondering how you reconcile, particularly for country-level data, the uncertainty around these estimates. Um, in particular, in countries that have poor data to begin with, they are going to be the ones that are going to be looking at these numbers as a way to set priorities. So how, to, how do you direct to them what is uncertainty, what, what is something that they should regard versus something that, that they shouldn't, especially when they're setting priorities for diseases. Thank you very much. Then it was one down here. Hi, this is a uh, Mike. Okay. Sorry. Uh, this is Chris James from Oxford Policy Management. I was Chris James from Oxford Policy Management. And um, I was particularly interested in the, the links with health policy and particularly with health financing and the issues around priority setting and resource allocation. And in particular, that link with these results around global burden of disease data with health expenditures. And I was wondering about that. And then I saw a slide by Chris Murray near the end about, about that, that area of, of research. And it's just really a kind of question about would that, what the plans are for that. Is it about linking it with, not just with total health expenditures, but also linking it, comparing, say, government versus uh, private health expenditure versus donor expenditures? Is there also linkages on what's being spent on prevention versus uh, curative care? It's just really a question of what are the plans to link up that, that research with the health expenditure? Thank you. Okay. Rafael Lozano, IHME. Uh, I uh, said in the, during the launch that I was uh, planning to keep quiet, but after Torre Godal intervention, it's impossible to keep quiet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good. Uh, you are say, say, uh, saying to us that apparently politicians are from Venus and researchers from Mars. So that's why we have to continue talking about infant mortality, because it's the only way that we can communicate each other. And that's, that's interesting, because after Chris uh, Murray's presentation, I have two solutions for you, Tore. One is use the visualization tool, or the other thing is more Chris Murray in each country. Because Chris is able, in three minutes, to build a story. Immediately, just watching the numbers, or probably less. We, we have experience working with him, and probably in 30 seconds, he can discover a mistake after all day working, or <laughs> he can also uh, make a story. So, but politicians, sometimes not. But now we have probably not a solution, but some help. The politicians can make their own story. Rather than sit and listen to Chris Murray or Alan Lopez, uh, they can build the story saying, comparing, because the, 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 the value of the data is not the level, it's a comparison. And that's why the instrument from Gutminder that all of you know from uh, Hans Rosling is a milestone in visualization because, but for me, that's still static. Now we have something dynamic. You don't, you don't need Chris Murray to build your story. You, you need your brain 
And you can start comparing and see this is, this is the things that we have to act. So I think investing in that direction will be a very nice solution. Thank you. I don't know who you attacked there, but uh, I, uh, my only plea was for simplicity in terms of expressing. Uh, yes. Um, Adrian Davis Before. from the UK. Um, I'm, I partly belong to the Department of Health, but also I, I supported and led the, uh, the stream of GBD around um, hearing loss and, and communication. Uh, and I think I'd just like to echo um, what Chris and Alan said about the, the things that we talked about yesterday and, and what was also said. I think the most striking thing is the ability to have that visualization and, and be able to have the reactions to it. And I think that's what causes some of the initial things. And one of the areas that came up there was the aortic aneurysm. And, and that showed very high rates. But we've introduced a screening program for AAA and, and there's evidence that actually um, that's fallen dramatically over the last two years. So it generates some of those some of those ideas. But there's also, I think, the need to reflect on that as well as have that immediate headline reaction. Because I think thinking about some of the things that Duncan Selby said today, you know, the, the problems that he's dealing with, the lags in terms of trying to reduce the risk factors are, are many years. So it's trying to understand that complexity. So the ability of those. Um, online tools to have look at it. It's very important to look at those and digest. So, so my question is that at, at the end of this, we, we, had a, we had a plea from Irene for much more systematic data systems and improved data quality. Um, and what I want to ask the, the panel and, and the, uh, uh, the, the key movers of, of GBD, is, is there a single simple um, idea you have for improving the, the quality of systematic data systems. Thank you very much. So that was the first four, and we then uh, uh, asked the panel to respond to this. Will you start, Chris? Sure. Can, <coughs> if I, can I use the computer to answer Please. the first question? Please. All right. So uh, if you can up there just switch. I want to sh try to answer the uncertainty question. Somebody in the booth up there. Oh, thank you. So uh, to, we've, we've really struggled a lot with how to communicate uncertainty. Uh, it's fundamentally hard because very often people will just zoom in on the average or the midpoint and ignore the uncertainty. And I will be the first to confess that we haven't solved it, but I think we've tried, for example, if we've Fit take, for example, uh, DALI's. We've tried to build some tools so that you can see the range on different causes. So if you look, and I think uh, Steve and Najib may talk about this in the risk factors, here's a set of causes that on average we may rank differently, but they're so overlapping if you look at this visual tool that you'd be hard pressed to really say they're different. And these are things from HIV AIDS to um, low back pain, across preterm birth, et cetera. So I don't know if that's the answer, uh, but I think one of the ways that we hope is to try to have some visual ways for people to be reminded about the size of uncertainty. And we also, in, in another type of visualization, which we haven't launched yet, you know, can color the size of different uh, causes by how sure or unsure you are. But I, I, I think it's a, a fundamental issue that you've raised, and maybe this is one way to get at it. Uh, just on that point, then, uncertainty at the country level, isn't also the country consultation process that you are sort of into, like with the UK, Norway, and other countries, where you will have that kind of discussion. That will also help, I think, to uh, reduce the uncertainty at the country level. And by having more frequent uh, 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 updating of data will also, I think, uh, move in that direction. Other comments? <clears throat> yes, I, I, I'd like to comment on um, two, two of the questions, Raphael and the gentleman from the Department of Health, in, in relation to um, you know, how do we make information available to politicians? I think you've also commented on this. So while politicians may be able to hold three data sets uh, at a particular point in time, by the time information reaches the politicians, it goes through so many filters, through the civil servants 
for working in multilateral institutions through so many layers and levels before the executive director sees this information. So what is more important, I think, is enabling the levels below the politicians uh, access this data. But more importantly, we're always talking about politicians and policymakers. I think what is great about the new data set is that it is available to the public. It is, it's a global public good. It is transparent. People can go and analyze it and begin to ask questions. That is critically important because it's the only way to hold to account civil servants, multilateral agencies, and politicians. So that's the first point. The second point is, um, when I was at the Global Fund, we invested al almost 15% of our budget in um, you know, funding to countries in data systems. That's quite a large amount, uh, around the $25 billion or so invested. That, that, that's almost $3 billion uh, of investment over a 10-year period. But it was yet, it was so difficult to get uh, high quality and relevant data. So maybe using, a, using the adage from uh, Irene, I would recall sort of an, the ancient mariner, uh, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Actually, there are huge amounts of data in countries, but most of the data are collected for multiple agencies, multiple projects, multiple institutions of highly variable quality and highly uh, questionable relevance. So I think we need to distinguish data versus information versus relevant intelligence that can be used for decision making, for priority setting, holding the politicians and the, um, uh, the, the people making this in the health systems accountable. So in addition to developing routine health systems, we need analytic capability for this transformation process. This is why visualization is very important. Uh, to be able to give the right kind of intelligence to the, to the people making decisions at the right time. But the beauty of the, the, the data set that's been provided is the ability to move this to the country level, to begin to ask questions, to identify the, the information gaps, not just data gaps, the information gaps, but also the misalignments, as we've heard uh, from the UK experience. So this is a great entry point into a discourse at the country level. And this is going to be a long journey. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the day after, but I think We've really elevated, the, um, elevated our abilities to, to, to new, uh, new levels to, to engage in this country level <coughs> process. But for me, the most importantly is transparency of the data for the public, for everyone to access it. Just a, a quick follow up, Chori, if I can. Just coming back to Adrian's um, point, that at the very end, you may have missed it, but he made a, a very clear plea, similar to what I think Peter Piat mentioned this morning about improving the quality of routine data systems. And I think this is an, an extremely important point just to, to, to reflect on. I tried to show this morning that one of, many of those boxes uh, that I went through very quickly uh, reflect a vast amount of effort to try to extract truth and information content from often very poor uh, quality data. Now, that, that's what's available. But the importance of, the, of that data and the data quality that Adrian raised is not so much for GBD exercises, but it's more for country use for their own internal planning. And what I think we have systematically failed countries is, uh, is to understand the importance of deriving quality data in their, from their own systems. And, and uh, while the, the GBG uh, methods could be applied and eventually will be applied, I hope, by countries to check data quality, they are complex and they will take time to disseminate. But there are simpler ways to do this. There are relatively straightforward ways, for example, around the cause of death data and mortality data, for countries to do simple checks on their, their mortality information systems so that you've got data producers also being data users. And I think that cycle, which is relatively straightforward, it's not the complex methods we're talking about here, but simple methods that will assist countries understand the importance of quality data and hence make them more useful for local policy planning. In this context, I would just remind everybody about the uh, Commission on Accountability and Information. Uh, which, among other things, established an independent expert review group uh, uh, chaired by uh, Richard uh, Horton and uh, J, uh, Joy Pumapi. And in that recommendation are several that re relate to uh, improving the quality of data, improving the speed of, 
of uh, data accumulation. So I would recommend that all these 500 scientists that are involved here should also start to work for Richard and company uh, in order to actually to, to strengthen vital registration and other key uh, uh, data that are of sufficient quality that they can really be used uh, so that the uh, modeling gaps become reduced uh, for Chris to fill. Uh, the second point I think is uh, here is that uh, the question of aligning health expenditure with disease burden. There, of course, there are more factors that comes into allocation of resources, but I think that is a very important area which I think has been relatively ignored. We had the fantastic TEHIP project by Don de Savigny sitting down there, where he did, in district level, aligned those two things and got much more health out of the money with the same uh, amount of money, uh, basically. And we now see it in Nigeria with the saving a million lives, where they are actually doing that kind of uh, allocation which again is one of the things that really makes us go behind them in their initiative because we think it will give also us more value for money as donors. So now we take the next uh, round of questions. And Shreenat. <coughs> Uh, seeking a clarification from Alan Lopez on the statement he made that uh, despite increasing urbanization, NCD rates are falling. Uh, are you referring to age standardized mortality rates or incidence rates or both? And secondly, is this a global observation, or are there substantial regional variations in this relationship or lack of relationship? Because in societies which are fairly advanced in their NCD epidemics, where the epidemics have matured, the reversal of social gradient will actually see greater risk factors and less access to health services in rural areas than in urban areas. Whereas in other societies which are earlier in transition, that may not be the case. So how will you qualify that, or is that a general observation? Thank you very much. Then was you down there? Uh, I'm Leslie Rushton from Imperial College in London. Um, and I've ha had involvement in a tiny, tiny bit of this um, project, which isn't being mentioned at all today, the occupational side of things. Um, uh, and I wanted just to comment that I think the tool that you've been showing, the interactive tool, is absolutely terrific. And I'm sure everybody will make a great use of it. Um, my, my question was um, really to do with the um, suggestion that you're going to look at prediction. Um, and I was wondering, um, in the UK, we've been looking at burden of occupational cancer, so a much, much narrower um, uh, area. Um, and one of the things that uh, the UK Health and Safety Executive have found useful is that we've developed um, a tool for, if you like, um, showing what would happen in future to the burden of occupational cancers from different carcinogens and in different industries um, under certain intervention scenarios. So that's really going back to the comment we've had earlier about um, not just looking at health services in the future and provision, but prevention. Um, and, and so we've been you know, experimenting with things like um, what would be the difference if you, say, halve the current exposure limit to if you kept the exposure limit the same but targeted, um, say, the small and industries versus the large industries, and would you get more bucks, you know? Um, what do you say? What do you say? Um, Yes, that's the one. Yes, somebody say <laughs> Anyway, you'd actually, it would improve matters. You'd get much better um, uh, improvement if you, if you focused your um, efforts. So, uh, again, thinking about the inequalities discussion we had this morning. Um, uh, and, and just another comment about the um, economic side of things. The, um, in the European Union, if you want to change the um, carcinogen directive, you have to do a socio-economic impact analysis. So you have to think about the costs. And again, we've 
done a sort of prediction for some of the um, potential occupational carcinogens where we've done a cost benefit, if you see what I mean. We've said, well, supposing you halve the limit or introduce the limit, what's it going to cost industry versus how much you're going to save in terms of health benefit? So I wondered whether in the prediction that you're thinking of doing, whether it would be possible to kind of build in some, uh, you probably want to do it at a country level because you'd need good data, but whether you could think about building your models that actually allow you to compare and contrast different intervention scenarios. Thank you. Thank you very much. There was uh, <coughs> other person down, please. OK, please. Uh, I'm Don Shepard at uh, Brandeis University. A question for Chris and maybe others. I had a question about multiple morbidities. We've heard from many of the speakers how morbidity is becoming the important uh, element and uh, the world is living longer. Uh, this relates both to uh, disease burden as well as allocating health expenditures. People don't just suffer from one disease at a time, they suffer from multiple ones. And I wondered if uh, we'd welcome comments about how that's been addressed so far and any further uh, future plans uh, for refining the process of multiple morbidities. The last in this round. My name is Sanya Nishter, and I want to come back to this question of data quality, because I think this is a very, very complex space. And a lot of times, we tend to assume, especially in the context of the, of the developing countries, that if a country is coming out with poor quality data, that, that it is an issue of institutional capacity or technical capacity at the human resource level. Or we make an assumption that there's an issue of inadequate in investment in data systems. But from pra practical experience, uh, I feel that it's a lot more complicated than that. Be because political factions actually have a disincentive to uh, aim for optimal data quality and independent systems because they tend to data tamper for political gains at different points in time. And an evidence of this uh, is, for instance, the immunization uh, coverage figures that we see from two different um, data sets. If you look at the social and living standards measurement surveys or the multiple indicator cluster surveys, which are conducted more directly by statistical agencies which are under the control of governments in the developing countries, there's a huge disconnect between those figures and the figures that come from DHSs, uh, which are conducted through more uh, independent channels. So the point I'm trying to make is that there is the huge, that there's a regulatory environment of data management and how that data flows, you know, very much to Riffert's point, from collection to collation to analysis to a synthesis to relate to the appropriate level for decision making. And governments actually want to keep this entire value chain, so to speak, and this entire institutional arrangement within their control uh, to, uh, so that they can, uh, I mean, for lack of a better word, tamper with it from time to time. And I think that one of the key policy interventions at the global level could be to call for legislation in countries so that data management systems are placed under independent oversight and control. And this links in back to the, uh, to the accountability point. Because unless we do that, we're going to continue to have data tampering, and all this will get packaged under the very loose term of data quality, <laughs> which I think hides some very sinister motives. Yes. OK, we will take you and then other person. And then I think we will probably stop the open discussion. And we will use the last minutes for Thank, thank you. George Mensah from the University of Cape Town. Absolutely agree with exactly what Sanya had said. And a quick question for Chris. And perhaps, Irene, if you could comment on this. The national uh, burden of disease studies have truly been independent. Uh, using the methodologies from the first GBD. But throughout Africa, I'm not aware of countries that have really embraced this fully, with the exception of South Africa. And actually, going to the point that Sanya made, just last week, uh, Lancet published the data from the burden of disease data from South Africa, showing clearly the results you see when you have policies implemented and you have independent monitoring and evaluation of the data. So to what extent, looking to the future, 
do you see this landmark work presented here leading to engagement with countries where we now have very sort of suboptimal data in either building national burden of disease studies that are truly independent and can focus on this issue and lead to more implementation? Because I completely agree with everything that's been said here that we're going to see more and more of these data shown, but knowing really is not enough. We have to translate that into action and do. And this, it would be nice to hear what you're thinking of for the future. So the last question down there. Thank you. Uh, Rahab Ali, University of Oxford. Just a, a brief question following on from what Alan Lopez said. So I think it was surprising to see the NCD rates falling um, over that 20 year period. And I was wondering how that breaks down by the broad categories of NCD, cardiovascular disease, cancers, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, um, and injuries. I mean, it is surprising given that most of these risk factors are increasing, particularly in the major population centers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then uh, I think uh, over to the panel. Perhaps we'll start with Alan this time. Okay, thanks, thanks, Tori. A couple of questions here about NCDs. Uh, What's important here, I think, is that we drill down. I think we've been encouraged to be playing with these data and looking at them in more detail and try and respond to and, 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 and understand the kinds of issues that Srinath and the last speaker have just raised. What I was talking about was the slide that I think Chris, uh, Rafael Lozano showed, and perhaps Chris also for Dallies, that the rates, the age standardized death rates, certainly for NCDs as a whole, the entire category of NCDs have gone down globally. That does not mean they have gone down for every disease. It does not mean that they have gone down everywhere or for every age group and sex. And I think we need to use the rich body of estimation and comparable methods that have been applied in the GBD to try to understand where they have and where they haven't gone down and for which causes. But as I recall, for the, for the vast majority, including the major vascular diseases, cancers, major cancers, uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, death rates are going down uh, worldwide. And we don't really understand why that is happening. Perhaps it's because the impact of tobacco is yet to be felt uh, in, in these populations. Perhaps they haven't been smoking long enough to kill themselves in large numbers. But these are important issues that we need to understand. Also the relationship with urbanization. So um, I, I, I do urge you to, to use these data to try to unpick these sorts of questions. As far as I can recall, it was Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and drug use. Uh, which were the, uh, the, the only NCD, major NCD conditions that have gone up in terms of age-standardized mortality rates. Perhaps my colleagues can, can add a bit more. Um, so that was, uh, so it, it was a rather simplistic statement I made, but it was to incite the kind of discussion that we were having about some of the observations that are coming out of the, the GBD that we think have important public policy follow-up and research. Similarly, no one said anything about injuries. And if you look at those death rates, death rates age standardized worldwide for injuries over the last two decades have gone down about half as much as NCDs, which have gone down about half as much as the, the category of communicable maternal, nutritional, and neonatal. What are we doing or not doing uh, with regard to injury prevention to reduce mortality? And finally, Chair, just I, I, I want to disagree uh, a little bit with, the, with the, the, the point here of using what I would call um, marginal interpretations of the GBD uh, to, to drive policy. The data tampering issue is, is certainly something we're aware of. Physicians, for example, in many countries in the world won't uh, certify the cause of death um, as the true cause of death because it may lead to social embarrassment or legal complications, and so they will certify it as something else. But those should not distract us from the main issue around data quality when it comes to, for example, causes of death. It's not those, those cases of, um, of deliberate misinterpretation, but it's the vast ignorance among physicians in most developing countries about certi correct certification of the cause of death, simple application of the WHO ICD certificate. If they did that, and we taught them how to do that, quality of cause of death data would be vastly higher. Irene? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll comment on the data quality uh, issue that Sunny and, and Sarah raised. It's a complex issue. And while you talked about government data tampering, I think it will vary from country to country. My observation from my work setting is frontline worker 
issues are bigger. Central government really doesn't care. They just take what gets there. But I think it varies from country to country. It's rather the incentives at the front line and the understanding and the analytic capacity. So you'll find what happens at the front line is that you're obligated to hand in a certain data set by a certain day of the month, or else your supervisor comes on you like a ton of bricks. So what you do is you push the data. And we've seen it over and over again. So sometimes, in fact, you go up to national level. I, I was a regional director, and I'm told this is the data from Greater Accra, and I'm saying, what? That is not the data from Greater Accra. When did you get this? And they said, we got it a month ago. And I'm saying, we've just finished reconciling the data. This is the correct data. But it's gone into the system. And it keeps moving up the system. And, and I think those are bigger challenges. And related to that, even more than legislation, I would talk about incentive systems. Because if I can use another small observation, recently we, we observed, for example, that um, Fresh stillbirths were being recorded as macerated stillbirths. Why? Because we set in a system of perinatal audits to try and get a handle on the high mortality rates. And some supervisor makes the midwives feel so bad if she records a, a fresh stillbirth. And the perinatal audit is so um, punitive that all fresh stillbirths become macerated stillbirths on the records, you know, just so she can go home in peace. And I think some of those uh, little on the ground issues, which really need a lot of attention, because I think it is unfortunate, but it all adds up. You know, two pieces of data here, 10 there, 20 there, and it keeps piling up on us. So, uh, apart from that also, there are issues of infrastructure, tools, and supplies, you know, computerization, and many low middle income countries, people are still doing paper-based reporting. Then somebody now has to enter the paper into a computer, the lights go out. It's a whole complex thing out there. But I, I think we need to pay attention to it because I suspect the investment then the gains made cannot be compared. And Rifat mentioned that you put a lot of money into uh, strengthening data systems. I like the quote, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. The, the problem is sometimes money is put into the country, but it is being macro controlled. And the problems at the micro level I've discussed, you know, like this issue of a midwife, midwives making uh, uh, fresh stillbirths, macerated stillbirths. It comes out because we have a medical anthropology student doing participant observation in some of our hospitals because we finally felt we are missing something. You, you don't get that when you macro manage the situation. Um, thank you. No, I strongly echo what Irene has uh, just said. Um, and, and also to follow on from um, Sanya's and George's comments, I think we need to focus on the information systems as a whole, um, not just collecting data. Otherwise, we could end up with masses of data that no one is able to uh, analyze or utilize. So we really need to create incentives, really at the call phase, to collect fewer data, but higher quality data, which can then be not just fed up. Data needs to come down when it's analyzed and um, uh, interpreted. To, to inform good practice and improvement. Once we go through that cycle, on the, only then we can begin to see improvements uh, in the system and create further demand for higher quality data collection. So it's a complex issue. But coming back to earlier comments, uh, I think the great opportunity with Global Burden of Disease Studies is to go down to the country level to begin to ask the questions and create the discourse on, on, um, on information-related issues. There was one other question in relation to multimorbidity, which, uh, which I uh, highlighted earlier on. I, I think this is a very important issue because uh, multimorbidity, A, it tends to affect the lower socioeconomic groups, so it's an equity issue. And secondly, in relation to health system expenditures, the small group that have multimorbidity account for greatest proportion of expenditures. So while focusing on individual disease is important, we should also try and identify individual population segments that have multimorbidity and develop appropriate interventions, including management of the risks and the risk factors and mitigation of these to, to, um, to prevent illness and to prevent uh, morbidity uh, in, in this particular group. Chris? 
I think, uh, let me just respond on two points. Uh, to Don Shepard's question about comorbidity, what was done uh, in the YLD paper, there's, there's a bit of a discussion. And in the rather extensive annex to the YLD paper, there's quite a bit more discussion. But basically, a microsimulation environment was used to try to capture what were the likely comorbidities in each age, sex, and country. Uh, and that can certainly be improved with better data on the correlation structure across different diseases. But it's, it's, uh, th there's a lot of rich information there that can be used, I think, uh, which we haven't really teased out fully here. Because there's distributions in each age sex group of what's likely the comorbidities that are out there. Uh, on George's follow-up to Sonia's comments about uh, independent burden of disease, uh, let me just ha have make one reflection about that. Namely, the way that GBD 2010 has been organized has been around diseases, injuries, and risks, with individuals uh, contributing on that sort of matrix by row. And then you know, trying to pull together all the data in an analytic way. And I think going forward, as we have a vision of continuous updating, it would be uh, great, we believe, if there was also in every country expertise that's part of the study that's not, you know, a diabetologist, but somebody who's actually interested in the totality of the pattern of health in a given country, so that you could sort of uh, cross-validate the, the views. And it makes it, it wasn't feasible in the 2010 study because it was only towards the end where we construct up a view of the countries, but now we start with a baseline. I think it becomes much more feasible to try to engage people in the ongoing enterprise to take a, a look at the results and say, no, no, that can't be, or it can be, or we're missing this condition, or there's a data set that you've missed on Mali. Uh, and I think that would be a, a, a huge extension and, and strengthening of not just the global and assessment, but also of a way to sort of make the results from the GBD seeded country by country. Uh, so. You know, I think that's add to the aspiration list around the GBD. Thank you very much. I have two comments, and then I will sort of round up. Uh, two comments. One is in relation to occupation uh, uh, and uh, health, the issue that was raised. Uh, just, it's, a, it's an NGO that is promoting, actually, uh, uh, workshops for young uh, girls in factories, and they have found that this is a very cost-effective thing because it really reduces absenteeism considerably. So I just wonder, in, with all the risk factors and so on, there may be some mining to do here uh, in, in that particular area where one could link then particular areas which could be of beneficial to the uh, uh, you know the the private sector uh, directly uh, the <clears throat> the second point is um, in relation to sonia's point and data and i think that there are perhaps we have uh, really two oppor two opportunities um, uh, one is that we see that i think ministries more and more understand they have to farm out. It happens in my ministry. It happens everywhere. We, can, we, we, we have not been very successful in building capacity in ministries, but we have been very successful in building capacities in uh, regional or national institutions like IFICARA, which was, had a very small budget when I was in TDR and now has a budget equivalent to TDR on this whole. And because of the re, uh, decentralization of the operational level of the health services, the central minister will be as interested in the quality of data as you and we are. And it's very important to present it that way. And the second point that uh, has been there, but increasingly is important, is for the allocation to the health sector, the Ministry of Health need to provide reliable data to the Ministry of Finance. And so that's another factor as the national component of the health budget uh, increases. I think here are 
are opportunities that ought to actually to to to, to help in in getting better uh, data. There are some aspects that is very political, as you know, uh, relating to demographic data and uh, and so on. But we'll, well, that's a separate issue. No. So I think at least I have been convinced by this session that uh, Dallas and disease burden, uh, there are really new opportunities to really to now to uh, get a much more uh, uh, active transformation into policies and policy directions than before. And it was just one thing that sort of hit home to me and that it was, of course, uh, uh, Chris is, uh, is not politically dumb either. So he, when he had this meeting yesterday, of course, he compared UK data with EU data. And in Norway, I can then advise you, you know, so if you want to have a relative benchmarking, nothing will be more powerful if you use Sweden as a relative <laughs> benchmark. So I'm optimistic. Thank you. <laughs>